Take your Bible with me, please, and go to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms. The Psalms teaches us how to walk with God. The Psalms lead us into the heart of God. And of course, the whole Bible is a book about God, but no book brings us closer to the heart of God like uh, Psalms does. And Psalm 27 is where we're at. I love this book. I love this psalm particularly. I memorized it. Well, our whole family memorized it when I was a kid at home, and, and I don't know if I quote it right off to you tonight, but i uh, very familiar, and, and a, a psalm that I love, probably one that you know. How many ever memorized Psalm 27? You memorize it? Okay, a few of us. And uh, it's a great psalm. I'd recommend it. If you're looking for one, uh, a passage to memorize, how many memorized any verses in the last year? Would you raise your hand? Good. I'm going to encourage you to keep memorizing Scripture. And that's something that will help you keep your mind on the Lord, heart on the Lord. And uh, we all need it. We all have things we're struggling with. Memorize the Bible. And uh, God, will, God promised a blessing for those that read it, a blessing for those that meditate on it, memorize it. And the uh, Lord will help you. There's nothing as wonderful as the Word of God. And uh, the, the living Word is the Lord Jesus Christ, of course. But there's nothing so dead and boring as Christianity without Christ. Some type of form. See, Christ is a living Savior. And the reason so much religion is dead is because they've left Christ out. And the Christian life is a faith life. It is a life that is entirely different. Uh, we have a different destiny. <laughs> we know that. That's the biggest difference, right? Our, uh, for believers, we're going to heaven for all eternity. And for the unbeliever, they'll be in hell for all eternity. And uh, look, if you don't know the Lord is your Savior tonight, that's what you need to do is trust Jesus and put your faith in Him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, and thou shalt be saved. But that's not the only difference. The truth is everything else is to be different in the Christian life. Everything. You know, part of the problem we struggle so much in our Christian lives is we're so much like the world when we're supposed to be completely different. We have a different father. We have a different citizenship. We're from a different world. The Bible says all these things should change who we are. We're not to be conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And so the Christian life is to be a Holy Spirit-directed life. You know, you heard Sunday of someone that was put through an awful trial that caused her to cleave to the Lord in a different way. But you don't have to go through an awful trial to cleave to the Lord. You don't have to have a child lost or a spouse lost or a disease come on that caused you to cleave. You can cleave to the Lord and draw nigh to God tonight, today, right now in your life. And that's what God would have all of us to do. We're going to read the whole psalm, Psalm 27. If you found your place, let's read. Uh, look there with me at the beginning of verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. This is a he and me psalm. As you go through it, you'll see it. Lots of personal pronouns, especially in the beginning here, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord. That will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. Hallelujah. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou sayest, seek ye thy face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not. Neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord. Lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over into the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. I want to draw your attention to verse 13, that phrase there. He says, I'd fainted unless I had believed to see. 
the goodness of the Lord and land of living. Believed to see. That's our title tonight. Believe to see. Believe to see. We are not to see and then believe. We, as God's children, are to believe and then see. We walk by faith, not by sight. Believe to see. Let's pray. Father, help us, please, from your word now. Teach us. Oh, may we glean some of the rich, rich, wonderful things from this psalm. Lord, there's no way we could preach everything in this psalm in this service. What a blessing. Uh, Just ripe. What an abundance of truth here. But may you give us what we stand in need of today in this hour by your spirit. May you press the matter to each heart what they need. You know specifically, intimately, where the needs are in each person and what area. And I pray that you'd guide and direct the, the preaching of your word and you'd bless it by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The psalm here opens with David on the mountaintop of faith. I mean, he's expressing a complete confidence in God. And uh, it's based on three things. Number one, the Lord's dealings personally. The Lord's dealings uh, personally. Uh, The Lord's personal dealings, if you will. The Lord's personal dealings. Notice verse one. Notice all these personal pronouns. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Boy, it's so key in your home that your children are not saying, the Lord is my parents' God. My parents are, have salvation. It must become personal, right? It must be mine. He says, the Lord is my light, not Jesse's light. David saying, mine and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And so these, this personal dealings of God in his life. Can I ask you, is your knowledge of God personal? Is it Personal. See, David's confidence in God's based on personal experience. Think back over the years. For David, he had put God to the test many, many times. And God never once came up wanting. He was always enough. No, he was always more than enough. Always. David is thinking of how God personally has worked in his life. David didn't close his eyes to the circumstances and pretend they weren't there. We, we read, read the whole psalm, there's enemies. I mean, even in verse uh, uh, 1, he's talking about fear. And, and he says, uh, afraid. In verse 2, the wicked. And ver- verse 2, the enemies. And verse 2, foes. And, and verse 3, this host encamping against me. And so he, he was living in reality, but he, he, he wasn't, didn't have his head in the sand in some way or something like that. But he looked beyond just the enemy and just the foes, and he looked through God's point of view. He looked at God. He looked with eternity in view, see. He looked beyond them to a God who is over all the circumstances. Makes me think of the three Hebrew children. They saw the fire, and they they saw it being heated seven times hotter than it was wont to be heated, and and, and they heard Nebuchadnezzar with his vicious change and in this fury and rage saying, if you don't bow, you're going in, the most powerful man on the planet. But they saw more than that. They saw beyond just all that and saw the king of kings and lord of lords. And said, so we're not careful to answer thee on this matter. Our God is greater. Our God is able. See, they saw beyond. It wasn't that they didn't see it. Look, we can see. We we can see what's going on in our country. We can see uh, things that are happening. We can understand things that are going on in our world. But our hope is not in this world. Our hope is not in our country. This election will not change the, the destiny of my life or yours if you're a believer. Hallelujah. We're looking beyond that. Now, we, we were praying for God's will, and we're, we're going to do our job as a citizen, but our citizenship primarily is not on this earth. It's in another world, see. And, and so we're looking beyond to eternity, see. He examined the circumstances from heaven's point of view. Listen, the Lord was everything he needed, just like he's everything we need. He's everything we need. For instance, verse 1, he says, the Lord is my light. He is our light. We don't need to fear darkness. I know some kids in here might say, I'm afraid of the dark. How many say I'm afraid of the dark? The truth is, everybody's afraid of the dark. Don't believe me? My dad had shot a moose up north uh, Manitoba. And, um, well, you can't just carry a moose out. And they shot about dusk, and uh, they, cut the, they, they, they field dressed it, cut the moose in half. And the guy took off with the four-wheeler, dragging the first half of the moose out. And, well, now it's dark. 
And dad is sitting on this corpse, half of a corpse of a moose, and all of a sudden the wolves start howling. How many know you're afraid of the dark? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Look, everybody's afraid of the dark in those types of circumstances. There's no question. And then it gets dark like that, and you start hearing. My dad said, I didn't know what to do. I started singing, amazing grace. There's power in the blood. He was just singing like a crazy man. What do you do when these wolves you start hearing howling? Praise God, God protect him. But he says he's our light. We don't need to fear darkness. God is our light. Then he says he's our strength. And by the way, it's interesting. That's the first time in the word of God, God is referred to as light. We see it all the way through the New Testament. But here, he is our light. He is our light. That's interesting. He is our strength. So we don't have to fear because of our weaknesses. You don't know all the weaknesses I have. I, I, you say, what's your strength and weaknesses? I've got all weaknesses. Hey, but he's our strength. See, he's our strength. You know, David understood weakness, but he said, the Lord is the strength of my life. Then he is our salvation. He says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Look, victory is sure. He is our salvation. I love what Romans 8, 31 says. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Victory is sure. Uh, think with me. Uh, if you think of these personal dealings, the Lord's personal dealings. Think of the prodigal, Luke chapter 15. The prodigal there with the pig pail. <coughs> where he's destitute, no man would give to him. What, what was it? What was it that came to his mind? What was it that encouraged him when he came to himself and thought back of home? What was it? <laughs> it was his father. He started thinking back of his father's house. He said, those servants there, they're dressed better than I am. <laughs> those servants have better food than I get. Those servants, they're treated better. I'm going home. What happened? The prodigal thought back to his home and his father and the experience of past personal dealings. It told him that his father would treat him with at least gentleness and generosity as much as he did with his hired hands. Luke 15 says this way, verse 17, And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. Notice again, not just enough, more than enough. So David, in the hour of trial here, based everything on his personal knowledge of God, his personal dealings. He says, he's my salvation. He's my light. He, he is the strength of my life. His personal knowledge of God. Again, I want to ask you, is your knowledge of God personal? Is it personal? Because if it's just based on what you heard from the Sunday school teacher or heard the preacher preach or what dad and mom told you, it will not stand in the trial of life. It has to be personal. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. It must be personal. Then the, the Lord's, not only the Lord's personal dealings, but you see here the Lord's past dealings. Look at verse two. When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. So David's past experiences told him that time and time again, God had stepped in. God had delivered him. We could go to the lion. He talked about that. We could talk about the bear. We could talk about Goliath. My God is able and my God will deliver you into my hand. We could talk about Saul over and over and over. God, I mean, mother had him surrounded, nowhere to go, and about to come around the mountain to where he is. And just then, he gets word. The Philistines have invaded, and they have to go and help with that. And God, just at that moment, showed up in time when they were trapped and would have got caught. Over and over, he, he knew from the past, we could see the same thing in our own personal history. Think back in your own life. Countless examples of God's unfailing goodness, his unfailing grace to you and to me. I think back how he met me as an eight-year-old boy. Praise the Lord and save my soul. Hallelujah. I think back when he met me as a 15-year-old young man in a hospital room when they said I could have died and, and he uh, subdued me during that time. It was good for me that God caused me to, to submit to him during that time and surrender to him. And, and then he lifted me up and got me out of the hospital and set my feet upon a rock. Hallelujah. That rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he meets us. There's past things we look back to how God worked in our life. The Lord's past dealings in our life. We could tell stories, all of us, of the Lord's dealings with us. We can Lord, point to the Lord's personal dealings and, and the Lord's past dealings in our lives. Hitherto hath the Lord helped us, right? 
the Bible says. We can say, verse 2, when the wicked, even mine enemies, my foes came upon me to eat at my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, verse 3, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. So, number three, we see not only the Lord's personal dealings, the Lord's past dealings, but the Lord's promised dealings. He says, though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. David's saying, in spite of this, I'm confident. In spite of that, if that were to happen, I am trusting. Listen, God had promised David the throne. And most believe the the occasion of this psalm is sometime during his uh, running from Saul while he's being hunted by Saul and and chased all over the hillsides. And and so uh, he, he knows I'm trusting the Lord. Obviously, it doesn't matter how much promises you have. It's still scary, and, and your life is still on the line. But he knew, and, 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 and when faith was surging, said, I know I'm going to be fine no matter if they'll bring a war against me, if all Saul's army comes against me, because God's promised me the throne. I'm not selling the throne yet. I'm going to be king. I'm anointed king. And think about that. His future was in good hands, and so is ours. Don't ever forget that. He, he's promised dealings, what God said he's going yet to do. And so you think about that. Now, that's three points there. But Tina said she wanted a long message. And, uh, and she said she would visit some other churches and they were too short. So I got three more for you. So that was just an introduction. All right, here's the big points. Number one, David in this psalm cries out to God. Lord, I long for your presence. Lord, I long for your presence. Verse 4, one thing have I desired of the Lord. That will I seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord. To inquire in, in his temple. First, th- first three verses, you hear the, just the confidence of David about his God. and all Because of these things. But the secret of David's public confidence was his private obedience. He had been with the Lord. He was obeying in seeking God and spending time with him. In fact, he's going to say there in verse 8, When thou saidest, Seek thee my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. He was seeking God with his whole heart uh, and, and spending time with God in private. He was seeking God. See, the most important thing about David's life was the part that only God could see. And by the way, that's true for all of us. Most important part of your life, no one else can see. Your spouse may have an idea about it, but they don't really know. Only you know how it goes with you and God. Only God could see. Now listen, verses 4 through 6. He says, uh, beginning in verse 5 again, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. <coughs> in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. The imagery here, verse 4, talking about you know, dwelling in the house of the Lord and, and, and all this. And his pavilion, the secret of his tabernacle, he, he will hide me in verse 5. Uh, the imagery here is like the Old Testament equivalent of John 15 and abiding in Christ. I love it. He says, I, I'm just so connected with the Lord. He, he's, he's hiding me in the secret of his pavilion where you can't tell where I am and the Lord begins or the Lord ends and I begin. He's abiding with him. I love verse 4 if you compare it uh, uh, to verse, uh, Psalm 23, verse 6. He says here, one thing if I desire of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Well, Psalm 23, 6 goes beyond all the days of my life, doesn't it? And he says, I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. (laughs) I love it. Could I just say this? I think I'm going to preach from verse 4 next week, uh, just that alone. But let me say this. If a Christian has no love for the meeting place of God's people, for the assembly of God's people, they have no passion uh, to be there and, and, and... when that's what forever is going to be like in heaven, there is something radically wrong with that Christian. David said, I want to tell you, there's one thing I'm passionate about, one thing I'm desiring, one thing that my heart's burning for. He, he wanted to be with God's people. He loved the meeting of the Lord and passionate about that. Oh, verse 4, he says, I want to 
dwell in the house of the Lord and behold the beauty of the Lord. Oh, if we could just catch a glimpse of the beauty of the Lord. What he is, that thought of the beauty of the Lord there has the idea, uh, yes, of, of the glory of who God is, his character, but also of the wonder and the richness of his goodness. Beauty of the Lord, his favor to his people. Oh, we'd be all right if we could see that. So number one, Lord, I long for your presence. Number two, Lord, I need your protection. Boy, this is true in both, both these are true in our lives. Lord, if the Lord would help us, this is what we should long for. Lord, I long for your presence. Number two, I think we all sense, Lord, I need your protection. Jesus would tell them to pray, lead us not into temptation. Lord, I need your protection. Notice verse five, from the time of trouble. He's going through it. Enemies we read about. People are lying about him, breathing out cruelties, verse 12. Uh, there's so much in this psalm. He says, for in the time of trouble. He's in a time of trouble. Uh, maybe some of you tonight are in a time of trouble. For in the time of trouble, verse 5, he shall hide me. Oh, don't you like that? He shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He repeats it. He shall set me up upon a rock. We know who the rock is. Lord, I need your protection. Lord, hide me. Hide me. Now, David likely is on the run from Saul. He's being hunted like a wild animal. Can you imagine this? <coughs> Saul saying, we're going hunting again. There's soldiers and everything. And who are we hunting? Oh, the guy that, the Philistines? No, no, the guy that saved us from the Philistines. I mean, it's the silliest thing, but for years he's, he's been hunted like an animal living in caves and in the forest and and. He's, he's out somewhere in a cave probably, nowhere near Jerusalem or Shiloh, the physical house of the Lord at that time, the tabernacle. But interesting what he says in verse 5. He's talking about the tabernacle. And he's talking about, uh, verse 6, he says, I'm going to offer in his tabernacle a sacrifice of joy. He, he desired spiritually what he could not have at that time physically. He couldn't go to the tabernacle. He couldn't be around God's people. But in his heart, this was his longing. This was his passion. He was desiring spiritually to be with the Lord. Not only hide me here, but Lord, help me. Lord, I need your protection. Hide me. Help me. I'm being hunted. They're coming after me. And now, verse 6, I love this. Shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me? Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing. Yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. You got to get loud when he says yea. He's emphasizing it. I will sing. Yea. I was going to sing. I'm going to sing. <laughs> right? Like that. Mary's poppy is with the Lord. He used to do that. He would say, oh, this, is, this is wonderful. And, he said, and they'd say, no, this is wonderful. <laughs> or something. He would be like that. That's what the Bible is doing there, though. It's emphasizing this. Yay, I'm going to sing to the Lord. <laughs> David's looking beyond. The enemies are still circling. We're going to keep reading about them. It's about to get worse, actually. But he's looking beyond to God delivering. Because he knows his God. My God's going to come through. My God's going to deliver. In fact, I can see myself bringing sacrifices of joy to the tabernacle. Now, he can't go anywhere near the tabernacle. But he's hiding in caves, in, in, in the barren lands, anywhere away. But he said, I can see it. I'm going to bring sacrifices of joy. You're going to bring me to what you've promised. I'm going to be singing praises. He's seen through eyes of faith after the victory. I don't encourage you. You see, this is a psalm of faith and fear. In fact, there's a natural division here. You might want to mark it in your Bible. Verses 1 through 6, Bible scholars call it the highlands of faith. Verses 1 through 6. Some have even argued it's written by two different people because there's such a, a roller coaster low in verse 7 through about the end of the chapter. But they call from verse 7 on the lowlands of fear. The highlands of faith, verses 1 through 6, and the lowlands of fear. But you and I live in the real world. <clears throat> this is just a snapshot of real life. Isn't that true? You can be high on faith and things go, uh, are, are, are uh, you're believing God's going to come through. And, and even in the same prayer, all of a sudden, doubt enters in. And fears enter in. And fears abound. 
Look, there are days when faith is weak and we have to remind ourselves it's not the strength of our faith that counts, but the object of our faith that counts. It's the Lord Jesus. He'll strengthen me. That's what he said in verse 1. He's my strength. The Lord's the strength of my life. Bring your weakness to the Lord and know his strength. But faith and fear. This psalm is all about faith and fear. And look, faith and fear are not compatible. (laughs) Where, where faith is ruling, fear flees. But where fear reigns, faith flees. You and I are living one of two kinds of existences. We're living either the faith life or a life of fear. Living by faith or by fear. See, the obedient Christian is learning to live day by day by faith. That's what the Bible tells us, where we walk by faith, not by sight. And by the way... Never forget, faith and fear live right next door to each other. Any of us can be overcome with fear. We see that in Elijah. Boy, calling fire out from heaven. The next minute he's running for his life and says, God, kill me. Uh, This is possible for all of us. They live right nearby. This is in in our uh, realm of of human emotions, what we can deal with. Verse 7, hear, O Lord, when I cry. With my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidest, seek me thy face, my heart said to thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. It seems like the heavenly father's withdrawn himself. You remember in, uh, in the Song of Solomon that, that the, the beloved comes and knocks, but she's sleepy and I don't want to get up right then. And by the time she gets up to the door, he's withdrawn himself. The Lord's a gentleman, doesn't push himself in. And this time, it feels like he's praying and seeking the Lord, but, but it's like the heavenly father's withdrawn himself. Verse 10, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Not only does it feel like the heavenly father's withdrawn himself, his earthly father's gone. Perhaps this is from 1 Samuel 22, where he, he remember he got so hot, he had to get his dad and mom out, couldn't. He brought him from the farm to the forest, and then it, it, well, that wasn't good. Maybe they're too old for that type of life, and so he, he took him to Moab. Remember that? David probably had a, they had some homestead in Moab. Remember great-grandma? She was Moabite. <laughs> Remember Ruth? Yeah, Boaz and Ruth, and Obed, and then Jesse, right? And then David. And so it, as far as we know, they're never mentioned again. So dad and mom maybe died in Moab. I don't, I don't know all of it. But father and mother, when father and mother are gone here. Of course, God never leaves us, but sometimes it seems that he does. Sometimes it seems like, Lord, where are you? Lord, where are you in this situation? We see that in the Psalms as we read many times. I'm crying out, Lord, hide not thy face from me. Lord, don't turn from me. Those we love and the Lord sometimes let us down. The the pressures of life start to mount up and, and the problems stack up, right? We pray, nothing happens. Worse, we have no desire to pray. What do we do? Verse 9, he's saying, Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God, of my salvation. You know what David's saying? I've been there. I've been there. What do we do? Believe to see. Believe to see. False witnesses. Enemies, you keep reading here in verse 11, teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in the plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. You know, when you follow Jesus, there'll always be enemies. <coughs> I'm not so worried about trying to describe what the plain path is in verse 11, I'm more interested in you and I being on the plain path. And we'll talk more about that in a minute, God leading us. But there'll always be enemies. And and verse 12, you see, tongues are more dangerous than swords. And we said, as kids, sticks and stones break my bones, the words will never hurt me. We found out in life that's not true, huh? Yeah, sticks and stones will break bones, but words will break your heart. Right? You know, the devil, if he can't get you with weapons, he'll try to get you with words. Lies. In fact, one of the abominations, remember Proverbs 6, false witness that speaketh lies. He said that's what's happening, verse 12. These false witnesses are risen up against me, such as breathe out cruelty. What they're saying is just cruel, it's wicked. You know, David's saying, God, I need your grace. 
God, I need your help. He's calling out, Lord, I need your help. Lord, I need your protection from this. But then I want you to notice verse 13, I had fainted. Oh, it gets good after that, but notice that, I had fainted. Listen, we all have the danger of fainting. In fact, it's a theme you see throughout the Bible, this idea of fainting. But if we keep our eyes on the Lord, notice he says, I'd fainted unless I'd believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. If we keep our eyes on the Lord, if we'll give our thoughts to Christ, we can keep from growing weary. Galatians 6, 9, remember, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season, what? You shall reap if you faint not. See, this possibility of fainting is all the way through the Bible. People are fainting. Remember, Jesus would say, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Faint. See, if you're not careful, your weariness will become fainting. Would you write this down somewhere? God is greater than your enemies. God is greater than your enemies. Whatever it is that you're dealing with, our God is greater than that. That's what he's saying. I, I, I was about to faint. I was about to fall. I was, I was struggling. And then I believed to see the goodness of God. In the land of living. God is greater than this. God is bigger. Paul said it this way, Romans 8, 34. Who is he that condemneth? It's Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? You're condemning. Christ is praying for me. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sakes we're killed all the day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. That's the enemies. That's the false witnesses. He says, verse 37. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God is greater. That's what he's saying. So on a practical note, what do we do when these thoughts of doubt arise? What, what do we do when, when fear creeps in? When, when weariness with the false witnesses and the enemies seem to overwhelm you. David would say in Psalm 61 too, Lord, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Well, the secret's right here. In verse two, like I said, he was talking about foes and the wicked and the enemies. And verse three, about the hosts and camping around them and, and all this. But verse four, this is the secret. One thing have I desired of the Lord. That will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. See, the secret is to get your eyes off of the enemies and get your eyes on the Lord. That's the secret. And see, the struggle is real. We all go through the struggle and the Lord has to help us. Lord, I need your presence. I long for your presence. Lord, I need your protection. Thirdly, lastly, Lord, I trust your person. I trust your person. Verse 13, I'd fainted unless I'd believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. When he finishes the chapter, can you see the armies? His mighty men, the people, no provision, no answer has yet come through. He's saying, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, wait on the Lord. It makes me think of Joshua and talking to Mo Moses, talking to Joshua, he's taking over. Be strong and of good courage. The Lord's going to help you. And the people try to encourage Joshua in Joshua 1.18, be strong you know, and of good courage. He's still saying, wait on the Lord. He's looking at God. Lord, I trust your person. Not, not the answer, not the provision, but the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. His character. I trust him. I trust you, Lord. That's what, that's what he's saying. I'm trusting the Lord. He has, doesn't have the answer yet. You know, we sometimes get so enamored with the what that God's going to do, we forget the who of who God is. You see, it's not in the provision, but in the provider that we get help. It's not in all the enemies being killed that the sheep is calmed. It's in the presence of the shepherd 
That's where the help is. And see, getting our eyes back on the Lord is the answer. I've got three, three more pages of notes. <laughs> so Tina's going to stay. The rest of y'all can go. <laughs> Just kidding. I think I'll preach the rest later. But we'll stop there. This last point is, is lengthy. But I'll leave you with that. We've got to get back to our eyes on the Lord, even though we don't have the answer yet. We may not see all the answers. You're going to be a frustrated Christian if you're waiting for the answer. You may not get the answer. You may not get it in this lifetime. George Mueller in our Sunday school lesson on Sunday said, do you have any prayers unanswered? Yep, 62 years, whatever, whatever. So many months and so many hours I've prayed for these two men to be saved. And as of yet, neither one has converted. <laughs> he said, well, you think they'll be saved? He said, you think the Lord would put this burden to pray for these people on one of his children and not plan to do anything about it? I'm paraphrasing. Two months, I think it was, after his death. They got saved. You may not live to see the answer. We may not, but we trust in the Lord and his person. And that's where the help is. Hey, you don't have to wait for the answer. <laughs> At any moment, you can have victory. What does 1 John 5, 4 say? Faith is the victory that will come to the world. It doesn't, the victory doesn't have to happen yet. But you can have victory because you're trusting and counting on the Lord. Isn't that, isn't that helpful? The answer may be months away. I'm going to live on pins and needles till we know who wins the election. Well, you're, you're going to be miserable for the next couple months. I don't want to live with you. Or we can trust that God's going to give us the best thing that we need with eternity in view, not just America in view. Now, I don't know what the best thing is. Oh, I know what I would choose. But maybe God knows we need persecution. Maybe God knows we need America to go down so people will be saved. I don't know what will best bring him glory. I don't know. But faith is the victory. He holds tomorrow. And he's going to hold my hand. Let's pray together. May we?